Good morning, Grove Church family, and welcome to our online service today. For the last few weeks, if you've been with us, you know that Sarah and I have been leading worship and it has been such an honor and a pleasure. And so we are so glad that you're here with us on our last day of us leading worship for the online service. Today, we will come together as a family. We will worship God. We will hear the word and respond accordingly. We will come with our hearts and we will pray together. And we are just so happy that we get to do this, not only with you online, but with the people in person and with the church globally here in Hudson County, in New Jersey, in the United States and across the world. What a privilege it is for us to be able to gather together as one body. We're so happy you are here. Welcome to Grow. It has been an honor and a privilege to be able to worship with you guys these last few weeks, to be able to come together and sing songs and praise God and confess and reflect and hear God's word. Next week, Pastor Steve will be back leading us in worship. But for now, for today, we are so honored and grateful to be here with you and feel so honored and grateful that you are here with us. So let's begin with our call to worship. This is the day that you have made, Lord. Help us to rejoice in it and be glad. Remind us of the privileges we enjoy as your people, to come to you in these moments, to confess our sins, to receive forgiveness and to give it, to pray and sing and listen, to renew our fainting spirits, to rest in all your promises, Open our eyes to see you, Lord. Open our ears to hear your word. Visit us through your Holy Spirit and help us to celebrate our faith. Amen. God invites us into a deep, faithful relationship with him. We are able to come to him and confess our sins because of what Christ has done on the cross, because of God's love for us, because of the transformation that the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. Because no matter what we confess, no matter the burdens that weighing on our heart, God loves us and God forgives us. So before we do our prayer of confession, let us just take a moment in quiet silence to tell God what is weighing on our hearts. God of everlasting love, we confess that we have been unfaithful to our covenant with you and with one another. We have worshiped other gods, money, power, greed, and convenience. We have served our own self-interest instead of serving only you and your people. We have not loved our neighbor as you have commanded, nor have we rightly loved ourselves. Forgive us, gracious God, and bring us back into the fullness of our covenant with you and with one another. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now hear this good news. This is the message that we have heard. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live by the truth. But, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus purifies us from all our sin. Praise be to God. As God has given us peace through Christ, so let us pass the peace of Christ with each other. 
Peace of Christ be with you all. Let us greet one another and pass each other the peace of Christ through the comments down below. Peace of Christ be with you and with you. Now we have a message just for the kids. So if all the kids can come, gather around together to hear God's word, followed by a song. Good morning, kids. I have a question for you this morning. If you saw me wearing this helmet, what kind of sport or exercise would you say that I enjoyed the most? Would you say that I was really into golf? Would you say that I really enjoyed playing basketball? No, probably not. You'd probably think that I was really into riding bicycle, which I am, you'd guess right. So how do people know that we are Christians? Do we have to wear a special kind of helmet or certain kind of t-shirts or maybe a special pair of shoes? No, it's not like that at all. In today's scripture, we learn that the main way people know that we are Christians is how we demonstrate love to one another. When we love each other the same way Jesus Christ loved us, people will know that we follow Jesus Christ. And so maybe that will look like uh, letting someone know that you love them and that you care about them, letting them know what you appreciate about them. Maybe it'll look like writing a note to one of your friends here at Grove Church and letting them know that you're thinking about them and that you care about them. Or maybe it's by demonstrating that you care for your parents by taking out the trash or washing the dishes. It might not be fun, but it's a way of showing them that you love them and that you appreciate them. So I'm going to pray for you guys. And we're going to ask the Lord to give you strength, to give you power, from the Holy Spirit to love one another. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each and every one of these kids. We thank you that your grace and your love and your mercy is upon their lives. We thank you that you are nourishing them through their families, through their parents, through their brothers and sisters and friends. We ask, Lord, that you give them the strength from your Holy Spirit to love one another in the same way that you love them. We ask all these things in the name of your precious son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, guys, we're going to get ready to sing songs unto the Lord. So if you're sitting, stand up and lift up your voice to an almighty God.
Today's scripture reading comes from John 13, verses 31 through 35. Hear now the word of the Lord. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I have told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Good morning, Grove Church, and welcome. For the past two weeks, Nicole and I have been talking about what it means to be the church of God here in the world, in this broken world, when Christ returns. And if you notice, we haven't really been talking too much about what the events will be leading up to Christ's return or what kind of signs and marks should we be looking for as much as we've been focusing on what we believe scripture focuses on, which is where will the church be when Christ's return? What will we be preoccupied with? What will we be focused on? And so for week one, we discussed the importance of living out God's word, not only gathering together for sermons and Bible studies and looking through our study Bibles, but actually using it to live out our lives and and using it to apply it to real life situations. That was week one. Week two, just to recap, week two was about humility in prayer. So what it means when we look up to God while at the same time looking down at others and what kind of prayers does God honor in regard to humility and prayer. So that was week two. This week, week three, we'll discuss a third and important element of the church for when Christ returns, when he's canvassing the world, looking for where his church is, what kind of distinguishing marks will set them apart. And so this week we'll be talking about participating in grace-filled, loving community. So word, prayer, and today, community. When scripture talks about loving the church, it's not so much talking about the things that the church does as much as it's talking about who the church is. And what I mean by that is we might love participating in communion together. We might love hearing a sermon together and singing praises to God together. But do you love who the church is? Because the church is not what we do. The church is the people of God. And so the question today is, do you love the people of God in the same way God loves you? To answer this question, we'll be looking at Jesus' last and final command to his disciples before his death and resurrection. Now, you know how important that last and final command is. If you've ever uh, left the kids alone at home by, by themselves and you gave them all these rules and everything and you're just about to head out that door and you give them that last and final instruction, it's usually one of the most important ones. And so this, in that same way, this is Jesus's last and final command to his disciples before, before leaving to go to be with the Father. We'll be looking at the question, when Jesus returns and his eyes are looking and searching throughout the world, where will he find those entering through the narrow gates? Where will he find you and I? Will he find a church that is eagerly and radically pursuing community together? or one that is divided and distracted by everything that's happening in the world. In today's scripture from the Gospel of John, Jesus has just finished washing the feet of his disciples. 
Well, let's pause for a moment and really think about this. Jesus, the word of God made flesh through whom all things are created and sustained and held together, has come down out of heaven and made his dwelling place amongst regular people like you and I. And knowing that he will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, knowing that he is about to return from where he came to be in the presence of God the Father, knowing that his time with his disciples is quickly running out, Jesus, in one last act of generosity and love, wraps a towel around his waist and washes the feet of each of his disciples. This means that he washed Peter's feet, who he knew would later deny him three times. But this also means that Jesus washed Judas's feet, who would soon betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, washed the feet of even those he knew would stab him in the back. In an ancient Palestine 2,000 years ago, washing feet was how people demonstrated hospitality toward one another. And it was often the responsibility of the household servant or slave. It was difficult and dirty work that required great humility. And here Jesus is, the head of the church, submitting himself to the lowliest of all the jobs but wanting to set an example for his disciples, Jesus washes the feet of those who would deny and betray him. This is the setting for today's scripture. It's in this context that Jesus instructs his disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. Let's pause here for a moment. The disciples were the strangest group of people you could see together in a room. Seeing them love one another was kind of like me finding out that Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg have been good friends for several years now. It's bizarre to see these people together. It's unexpected. It's strange. It's it's strange to hear that these people love one another. Because some of Jesus' friends were zealots and others were tax collectors and some were fishermen and others accountants. Some were hungry for political power and others were just happy to follow along and be part of the gang, not knowing how things would turn out. Aside from their teacher, their rabbi Jesus, they had very little in common with one another. And yet Jesus calls them. He calls you and I to set aside differences and agendas and arguments in order to fall in line under the banner, the beautiful banner of Jesus Christ. To be clear, this new command is not very new at all. But now it's wrapped up in the new covenant. Now it breaks beyond geopolitical boundaries. Now it goes beyond ethnic identities. Now it serves a testimony to all the world of who Christ Jesus really is, that they too might come to believe in who Christ said he was. As I have loved you, Jesus says, so you must love one another. He calls you and I to follow his example of love, his example of washing feet, his example of offering hospitality and doing difficult and dirty work, his example of setting aside even your life for one another, and to do so for your brothers and sisters in Christ as Christ Jesus has already done for you. This is what love is in God's kingdom. This is what love is in Jesus's eyes. It's not a funny feeling that we get in our gut. 
It's not like something we can fall in and out of on a whim, on a daily basis, based on how we feel. As John Mayer puts it in his song by the same title, love is a verb. Love is an action. Love is what happens when we not only believe in the gospel, but we live it out in community. In closing, Jesus says this, by, by this, by this love that you have for one another, by this submissive love, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is the mark of God's people. This is what sets them apart from the rest of the world. And it's, it's completely amazing. It's completely amazing because we spend so much time fretting about evangelism. We worry about things like having awkward conversations with strangers. We spend countless amounts of time and energy into marketing campaigns and Facebook ads and friends and family barbecues and fancy websites and discipling programs. And none of these things are bad, but Jesus gives us a simpler way. He says, love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. When you look at the book of Acts, this is how the church grows daily. They had revival by today's standards, not because of their fancy websites or how much their budget was for uh, placing ads in social media. Their revival came about because they loved one another. They set aside their differences for one another to come under the umbrella of Jesus. They loved each other in the same way that Christ loved them. They loved each other by their actions, by washing each other's feet, by submitting to each other, by being hospitable to one another. And by this, everyone knew. By this, everyone continues to know. Not by anything else, not by pushing politicians into political offices, not by winning over the powerful and the elite, not by winning over soldiers and police officers, not by convincing society's movers and shakers to get on board. It was not by winning over more Christian celebrities. It was by the simple and divine act of loving each other in the same way that Jesus first loved us. Now, right about now, I know some of you are thinking, of course I love the church. I love participating in the body of Christ. Of course I love the people here at Grove or the Christians that I meet here in Hudson County or the Christians that I meet online from across the world. And I would agree that time and time again, I see Christ, signs of Christ's love right here in our community, right here in the church in Hudson County. But while I believe that this love is indeed genuine and authentic, I also believe that Christ calls us to be a people who are constantly perfecting their love for one another. And so I've gathered together three signs that I believe indicate a, a healthy and loving community of believers. The three signs of a healthy and loving church are first, fearlessness. A loving church is a fearless church. The author of the Gospel of John would later write in one of his letters, there is no fear in love, for perfect love drives out fear, for fear involves punishment. Church, have you felt afraid lately? Has fear pulled you out of love lately? Is your soul shaken by what you hear on the news, or is it strengthened by Jesus' love for you? Is your soul distrustful, skeptical, or cynical, closed off from others because of what you hear, or is it set free by Christ's love for you and who Jesus says you are? I'm not talking about rational fears that keep you out of harm's way. I'm not talking about irrational risks that put your life in danger. I'm talking about fears that lead to grumbling and complaining and division amongst brothers and sisters. Are you allowing fear to separate you from others? Or are you allowing love to bind you 
together. We cannot, I believe this was John's point, we cannot act out of both love and fear at the same time. The two things just don't mix together. We cannot live in Jesus' love and be shaken by earthly divisive fears simultaneously. John writes, the one who fears has not been perfected in love. A loving church is a fearless church. A loving church doesn't see change as a threat, but rather an opportunity. And so my question to you this morning is, what deep-rooted fears do you have? What kind of worries consume you, consume you when you are going to bed at night? What is robbing you of the courage that you have in Christ this moment? The second sign of a loving church is joy. A loving ch- church is a rejoicing church. The Apostle Paul writes, do everything, everything without grumbling or complaining so that you may become blameless and pure. Again and again, he reminds the church in Philippi, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Church, are you setting your eyes on what God is doing this very moment rather than paying attention to what he's not doing? Are you looking to see where the Spirit is moving rather than where he is not moving? Are you celebrating Christ's victories, even the small ones? Or are you embittered and disappointed and divided? A loving church is a rejoicing and celebrating church, even and especially in the midst of hardship. The third sign of a loving church is growth. A church that is being perfected in love is ultimately an expanding church. The rate of this expansion is completely in God's hands, but nevertheless, nevertheless, the loving church is one that grows again and again. When we look at the church in the book of Acts, their numbers increase out of community faithfulness to love one another. You might be thinking, well, isn't quality better than quantity? Isn't our faithfulness more important than our numerical growth? And while I wholeheartedly agree, I would also say that the first naturally leads to the other. Growth springs forth out of faithfulness and love. In the same way that a healthy plant can only grow out of good soil, so does numerical growth come out of community love. Our primary primary responsibility is to love one another as Christ has loved us. And growth is the divine outcome. To summarize these three points, a loving church is a growing church, A loving church is a rejoicing church, and a loving church is a fearless church. These three things are indicative of a church that has radical, grace-filled, divine love for one another, submissive love for one another. But how do we perfect our love for each other? Where do we start and where do we begin? Here are some practical steps you can do to live out God's love for one another, and also God's love for those around you. The first is be patient and kind with one another, particularly with your online presence. Sometimes we log in at 11 a.m. and we pass the peace to each other, the peace of Christ, and by 4 p.m. we're already writing angry, inciting comments online, participating in heated and divisive arguments and posts somewhere else. When you see something divisive or controversial online and you start engaging in that divisiveness, it works great for the social media platform. It works great for Facebook or Instagram or whoever it might be. It's wonderful for the people that post that thing because now people are engaging and talking and interacting. And it's excellent for the advertisers who are uh, trying to gain demographic information about you. 
and target their audience more specifically. But it's terrible for you and those around you. You're ultimately the only person that loses in that situation. Some posts are designed specifically to spark outrage. They're not designed to inform you or enlighten you. They're not designed to make your life better. They're designed to anger and divide. And you play right into that trap when you leave angry and divisive comments. But instead of that, you can use the opportunity to be a peacemaker, not only in person, but also online. Be a peacemaker in the comment section of controversial posts. Be a peacemaker when everyone else is divided. Choose to be a peacemaker. Choose to be a blessing and not a curse. Bring people together and not apart. Be patient and kind with one another, even and especially on social media. The second is to not envy or boast or be proud. These things put a strain on community love. It is very easy to say something divisive and gain approval or affirmation for it. Creating an us versus them mentality is easy because it doesn't take much to gain a following when you appeal to people's greatest fears. That's how mob mentality starts. Being a peacemaker, however, is hard work. You won't get many likes or signs of approval for it, but you'll please the one whose opinion about you truly matters in the end. Use your words Use your keyboards to encourage one another. Let others know how much you appreciate them. Let others know that their service has not gone unnoticed. Let others know that, that you love and care about them. Send someone a text, a phone call, or a letter and let them know how much you appreciate them. Ask yourself, what do my words bring to the table? Are they nourishing and emboldening the body of believers, or are they a stumbling block for others? Are they stimulating kingdom vision and imagination, or are they stifling what peop- what's possible through the work of God? Be slow to anger and forgive one another. Amongst yourselves, amongst your families, online, in person, wherever you are, be slow to anger and forgive one another. If you're having a hard time forgiving someone, start by praying for them. One of my professors, Ron Walburn, would say, it's very hard to curse and to bless someone at the same time. So start by blessing that person in prayer. If you're having a hard time forgiving someone, start by keeping that person regularly in your prayers. And lastly, One way to perfect our love for one another. Follow Jesus' example of washing the feet of others. Now, what I mean is not literally washing feet of others, because in our culture that might be kind of strange, but follow the example of submissive hospitality. Follow his example of laying down his life for others, for you, for me. He died for his enemies. He died for the people that didn't believe in him. He died that they might turn from their evil ways, repent, and have eternal life. Even when they were people that denied him. Even when they were people that would backstab him and betray him. We're living through one of the most anxious and divisive periods in many of our lifetimes. So be different. Stand out. Be holy, be particular, be strange like the disciples were. Be the oddballs that no one expects to see hanging out together and loving one another. Be the people that makes heads turn and people say, what is going on with this church? I want what they have. Be a reason for envy in people's lives that they might see your relationship with God and want just a small taste of that. People are yearning for community, yearning for community right now. Be that loving and grace-filled 
community boast about how great God is in your life through the hard times and through the good times. Show people that God has been faithful to you thick and thin, through and through, time and time again. Show people that God has provided. Brag about God's amazing love, even for somebody like you, even for somebody like me. Brag about his amazing love. Brag about his amazing, gracious community. Brag about his amazing faithfulness that the whole world may see, may taste, may feel the love of Jesus Christ through us and by how we love one another. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious and everlasting Father, we thank you that uh, you have brought together a community of believers right here in Hudson County, but also that we're participating in something so much greater than ourselves. We're participating in the church global, the church universal, the church worldwide. And it is by grace that we get to participate in all this. Help strengthen us, Lord, that we may radically and generously love one another, that people may see what we have, may see that we are connected to a large body of brothers and sisters worldwide, and they might want to take part in that family too. Lord, you say in your word, it's by our love that everyone will know. Help us to focus less on the things that don't glorify you and focus more on the things that do. Help us to be bound to one another under the beautiful banner of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For those who would uh, like to give, if you visit us on our website, grovechurchnj.org, there's an option for you to give digitally. If you would rather call the church and mail in a check, you can find that information on our website as well. And also, if you have any prayer requests, visit our website, grovechurchnj.org, where we also have an option for you to leave your prayer request online, and where you can find our email and our phone number if you would like to call or email in your prayer requests. We would love to pray for you. If this message has been a blessing to you in any which way, please feel free to subscribe, to hit the like button, to, or to share it with somebody else that might need to hear this very same message. Now, receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.
Oh.